Today on the Wrestling Roundtable, Lesnar Mir 2 from UFC 100, UFC 101, and other stories in mixed martial arts, along with the best and worst big men. To my left, which is your right, he is a 2000 regional high school champion, a 2007 Grappler's Quest gold medalist, and the director of the Grappling Kings, Rodney LeCant. To my right, which is your left, first, a vault manager, a fan of 16 years, and not the former NWA tag team champion, Chris Harris. Last but not least, he represents Team Oliveira. He's been an MMA fan for 12 years. Martin LeCant. Your referee when the talking begins, Eric Santa Maria. But before we get to that, we of course have to take care of some business. We want to remind you to go to WrestlingRoundTable.com where you can get this great Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt and get a free indie pro wrestling DVD with every order. You can get the link on our website, WrestlingRoundTable.com, where you can also sign up for the message board, talk about some of the topics in pro wrestling and MMA. And we also have a group on Facebook now, so look for that link on WrestlingRoundTable.com. But we want to jump right in because last time we had a video, it was the blog I did from Las Vegas where I talked about the great and historic UFC 100 show, but the fight we did not talk about was the main event. I was saving that for the table. Unification match, the interim champion Frank Muir against former NCAA and WWE and first UFC heavyweight champion to do all of those in combination, Brock Lesnar, who's also, by the way, the first to set the same record in WWE and UFC because he's the first to win the heavyweight title the quickest in both companies, work and shoot. Very interesting. Yeah. But this fight was a shoot. Shoot out is more <laughs> like it. What would you guys think of the fight? He beat him up like a high school bully. Yeah. Mir did not look good after that fight. Like hamburger face. He, he <laughs> had that goofy smile on his face before the second round, and that smile was gone about two minutes into the second round. Well, I'm glad you got to see that fight live because I originally, for UFC 98, bought tickets to see that fight, and, of course, you know what happened with uh, Mike Mir. <laughs> But I thought Brock Lesnar had a very good game plan. He really nullified Frank Mir's jiu-jitsu. He passed the half guard really well. He had him in that reverse half Nelson, had his arm locked, and just completely with these mat trucks on his arms, just smashing him, smashing him, smashing him. He left him defenseless. That was his strategy. So that brings up a question about what Mir was saying before the fight, that Brock's just this big knucklehead wrestler. He doesn't know jiu-jitsu, even though he's at least a purple belt. He doesn't have skills. He doesn't know anything. Did Brock sort of go against that, or was it just brute strength overcoming skill? It was just brute strength over skills. It doesn't matter like what you. But I mean, was there strategy? That was the strategy. It was strength. It was just like the strategy. He was. He's just gonna use his strength and avoid his jujitsu. He's same as Sean Sharks, also a wrestler, and avoid. Except much more steroids. I think it was more of a combination. See, the thing with these heavyweights is that now some of these guys they rely more on strength. As MMA is evolving, the strength becomes more skill. So Brock Lesnar is this unique athlete who is fast, really agile for his size, but now he's getting all these technical aspects. And as an NCAA wrestler, he's quicker to adjust to jiu-jitsu grand game. He has a great base. He showed it. Mir in the pre-fight said that he wanted Brock to pick the poison of standing up with Mir. Mir was really confident after his knockout win over Nagara. And no matter what Mir says about the first fight, he was hurt. He claimed he was fine in the first fight. I don't give a fuck what you say. Mir was hurt. He was in trouble until the last 10 seconds of the fight. Brock was now smart enough, and now he had a few fights in, into this fight, really controlled Mir on the ground, and he showed that he is one of the dominant heavyweights in UFC. A lot of critics are still saying, though, that Brock isn't particularly skilled at anything, much like Mir was saying on the ground so, so specifically. So what if you're not, he's still winning? Mm -hmm. that's, that's all that matters. Winning is what it takes to be the champion. Look, exactly. he's not hes not going to look like Anderson Silva mm -hmm. on the feet. He's not going to look like BJ Penn on the ground. But he's five fights in, and he's a heavyweight champion with a ready title defense. And he avenged the only loss that he had, which was the fight last February, where he dominated 99% of that fight. Is a rubber match called for? 
I would say you go for it. Think of the, the money they're going to bring in, the attention it's going to get. After all the, the shit that Brock said after this fight about him still running his mouth about Mir, this is just going to be a huge rematch if they do go with the third. And then you have the definitive winner also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Frank Mir, he just like talks so much and he's just so confident. And then it's awesome to see somebody like that just shut up and then... Well, of course. Everyone likes to see a loud mouth get their mouth shut. Yeah. But like I'm sure a lot of people thing. thought Brock was a loud mouth after the fight. Yeah, two will, loud mouths going in this fight. We will fight. get to yeah. in a moment. But the reason I ask about a rubber match is if Brock dominated both fights and barely lost the first one, with such a deep heavyweight division, is a third match really called for? I, I don't disagree. Think I'm going to disagree. I don't think a third match is called for. I think Brock proved in the first and second fights that he is – equal in skills or even better than Frank Mir and the heavyweight division is getting deeper and deeper you have ultimate fighter season coming up with a whole new breed of heavyweights you got Velasquez and Shane Carwin Mirko Krokop is back in there he's the X factor but you haven't even mentioned no Gary no sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm not saying that you should do this fight like in I, January I, I say maybe like a year and a half from now if Mir works his way back up yeah. why don't you go for it there's two minute heavyweights coming up that are gonna maybe surpass Frank Mir in the rankings. If that's that true, they're then gonna then want to see that fight. It to, if it's true, that you don't give it to. The them. reason why people want to see this fight is because of the intrigue of the first one, and people know that Brock was winning ninety nine percent of the fight, but and he still, lost to inexperience. But still, on paper, it says one and one between mm -hmm. those two. Exactly. On paper, but, but I don't think the buy rates would show up to add another. Main it's event. just like the same way. Like take the. Couture, Liddell, and then take the GSP and Matt Hughes series. They fought three times. GSP kicked his ass in the second fight, and then the third killed him. Well, Ortiz and Shamrock had three fights that and Ortiz oh. killed him in all three. Right. Killed him in all three. So that me, still drew. Mm -hmm. They were all okay. different circumstances. The reason why Ortiz Shamrock three happened was because of the controversy of the second one, and it was free on Spike TV. Mm -hmm. Let's get to the post-fight antics of Brock Lesnar. Big uproar about this, especially because the media was covering it because of the 100th show more than anything. A lot of fighters are upset that he's disgracing the sport. Is that what he did? Bullshit. I don't think he's disgracing the sport at all. He's just trying to be a legit fighter. Fuck it. I wouldn't say it's disgraceful, but it's unprofessional to go out there and badmouth your sponsors. He might not be paying you specifically, but he's paying Dana White and your company to keep you guys in business. That's not something you go out there and do. But can you blame him for being so upset because he fought so hard to get this victory and people still are not giving Regardless of what you say about the fans and the media, you don't mess with the money. Because mm -hmm. you're not going to get paid if you keep doing this. That's, That's the only so. thing I disagree with was him saying all the bad stuff about Bud Light. You watch the countdown, all the stuff Mir was saying about Brock mm -hmm. Lesnar, throwing out all these jiu-jitsu terms that say, Brock, you know, maybe down the line, you'll understand the stuff. And having one of his training partners dress up as Brock and knocking him out, of course it's going to get to you, anyone. But I would rather see stuff like this instead of BJ Penn saying, I'll kill you, Sean Shurkin, after the match. I love you, man. Come train with me in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. See, to me, that insults my intelligence. Brock was just built Working up with emotion. Brother. He said, you know, I'll do my talking after the fight. And that's what he did. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about some of the other heavyweights in mixed martial arts. So stick around. More Wrestling Roundtable coming up next. Welcome back to the Wrestling Roundtable. Joining the panel is Tim Conley, an MMA fan of just two years, but that's what YouTube's for, isn't it? Yep, thank God for YouTube. Right. So we were talking about some of the heavyweights that make up mixed martial arts, specifically UFC in their division, for what's going to happen with Brock now. The thing is, though, everybody, the media, not just the hardcore fans. My dad said, oh, I heard Brock's going to be fighting this Russian. My dad, who doesn't know anything about this, everybody is talking about Fedor Emelianenko. And we all know what happened, affliction, after that whole fucking Josh Barnett shit went down. Oh. Now they're back as a sponsor, and a lot of their fighters were picked up by UFC. However... One of them is not the current Whamma heavyweight champion and the last Pride heavyweight champion that everyone wanted, including Dana White most of all, Fedor Emelianenko, who just signed with Strike Force, and they're going to be doing co-promotion with M1 Global, his company, or that he partly owns. Was that a good move by Fedor? For M1, it was good because now they get the chance to co-promote and take away from the monopoly that they don't want UFC to have, as if this is Fedor's practice to fight in a cage before he fights for the cage for the main stage, if you know what I mean. People want to see him fight the best. They say this guy's the best pound-for-pound fighter, the best heavyweight, 
And he's proved that with the guys he's beaten in Pride. But really test himself, go to UFC, and as a fan, I feel very cheated. There basically is no one in Strike Force. Not even bad for fans. I think it's a bad career move for him. It's going to tarnish his reputation yeah. because a lot of people are saying now, and I think it's silly, that he's afraid to fight Brock. I don't think he's afraid to fight Brock. I think he's building up. That's why he signed with Strike Force. He's just going to build up. He's just going to knock guys over and kill them. And then when he's ready to sign with UFC, he's just not ready for UFC. He wants to build up. Get I don't think in the so. Cage. I don't think so. He's taking a big risk. There are basically three guys in Strike Force he can fight the champion, also Overeem. Mm -hmm. And they're not even Doom. doing that. Lesnar yeah. was going to have an immediate title shot against Fedor right. when he came in. But they're saying that they're not going to do Overeem and Fedor right off the bat. Which is stupid. To me, the most intriguing fight is Brett Rogers because of his dominant knockout over Arlovski. So what happens if he does the same thing to Fedor? Who's going to be interested in Fedor and Brock? Mm -hmm. It puts him at risk to lose to a lesser known guy. So then people will think, this guy is all hype. Why do we even want him in the UFC anyway? Well, I know if I'm coming in to a booming company like UFC... And I'm gonna know I'm gonna get paid three million or more to fight Brock, and I get a shot right away. I'm going there. It would have been a ridiculous, ridiculous contract to would have gotten. You have to strike when the iron's hot when it comes to this. UFC made more concessions for Fedor than they ever have for anybody ever, up to the point of co-promotion, of course. And that's where I think people aren't seeing the big picture. When people are saying that he's afraid to fight Brock, pff, get the fuck out of here. No, it's about they, money. I don't they're think not so. taking into consideration that he's a co-owner of M1. Those are his friends. Not to say anything about the mob, but that's another thing. I really think that M1 Global, what little roster they may have, this is the only guy they really have as their bargaining chip. And not just that. We know how UFC has been expanding internationally yeah. into Europe. Now they want to go to Mexico. They want to go into Japan as well. But you know if they got Fedor, all of a sudden Russia would open up. M1's home territory. I don't think they want UFC coming in and taking over. Now, I do think it is pretty stupid, this whole co-promotional thing. We know they're not going to bend that way. But one of the concessions they were making for Fedor was you can have your M1 Global banner on the tights, half the pay-per-view cut, whatever it might be. That practically is co-promotion, I would think. It is. Pretty much. And they didn't want people wearing affliction. They said, you can do Sambo every, anytime you want. You can wear as many M1 Global shirts. I, I don't know if they were going to let some of his guys onto the UFC roster, but it was not a smart move. You're putting yourself at risk. It wasn't good for the fans. So do you think down the line after he gets his three fights in or maybe the dream New Year's Eve fight in December that Fedor, possibly if he's not defeated, which we know how likely that is, Four more wins under his belt in another year. Is it still feasible that he'll end up in UFC? Yeah, because it's more media attention. It's, it's, more it's one year. Wins. It gives him U.S. exposure. The thing is, a lot of people in the U.S., the general public, the, still don't know who Fedor Malenko is. The pay-per-view numbers didn't show an affliction. This gives him a chance, especially if they have him fight on CBS, to build him up so that maybe after a year, if he decides to sign with the UFC and Brock is still the champion, it will be more money. More money, more pay-per-view buys, more attention on Fedor. They both have to win. That's what it comes down to. If they just both keep winning, it's going to build up the hype. These two guys are clearly the best. I mean, Brock's coming to this. He beat Mir, and he's the champion, but he's still pretty new. And UFC, if Brock wins three or four more fights and Fedor wins three more fights, I know I'm getting hyped up. These are obviously the two best heavyweights in the world, and they need to go at it. Well, one of the opponents that came up as a possibility for a a replacement for Josh Barnett was Bobby Lashley, who would have had to have taken the fight on like a week's notice. I guess it was a smart move. He didn't do that. Right. But that's a name we've been meaning to talk about on the roundtable for a while because that's the second real big crossover from wrestling in the past few years into MMA. Mm -hmm. He's had four fights so far, and they've gone probably about a total of 20 minutes combined ring time. What do you guys think about Bobby Lashley's MMA fights so far? I think they've been all right. He wasn't really impressive against the Jason Guida fight. <laughs> not and at all. Not at all. Not I mean, this all. is a guy who's 17 and 20, and nobody knows who he is. And he almost got choked out by him. His last fight where he choked the guy out, he was good. That was better. That, yes, that was a lot better. But he would have gotten crushed by Fedor Melianko. I think he relies too much on his wrestling. Yes, exactly. he has power, but I don't see a whole lot of technique there. Well, what do you think of the Bob Sapp fight, though? 
Well, Bob Sapp never had a stellar record in the first Bob place. Bob Sapp, once he was on the ground, he knew he was done. Uh-huh. He, this guy doesn't have a great guard. He's basically all power. That's the one heavy way you can say it's all power and entertainment. But once again, he's being called Black Lesnar, not just in the pro wrestling sense, but now because of the MMA sense. And once again, they couldn't be any more fucking polar opposite. Because if you think for a second that Brock wouldn't have been able to destroy Jason Guida let alone go 15 minutes with him and not yeah. finish him off. You look at the level that Brock has faced, look at the level that Black Lesnar has faced. It's mm -hmm. two different sides of the story. So do you think signing with TNA was a bad move because that killed off any potential UFC signing? Yes, yes yeah. because even he said after after he fought Jason Guida, he was already talking about going on the 10th season. Yeah, that didn't happen though. That but didn't happen. he's also earning another paycheck for like a couple days worth of work a month. If he can do fighting and pro wrestling not get hurt in doing either one of them, that's some more extra money. Do you think TNA would let him do that, though? They are letting him do that. The UFC's not going to let him pro wrestle. Right. And I know it comes down to what your interests are first. Like, if he wants to pro wrestle, I don't think he's going to UFC anytime soon if he I, still wants to wrestle. Well, I would think he knows that. The whole thing with Brock, what these MMA purists, they really, even a lot of the fighters, really go back to Brock's pro wrestling background. Lastly, going back to pro wrestling, trying to do both, I think just reinforces that stereotype of these wrestlers trying to do both. Yeah, he's earning two paychecks, but I think combined, if he went to UFC with all the sponsors and the TV exposure, it would have added up to more money than what TNA and these small promotions are offering. Well, I think his strategy is to get some more experience under his belt, and if he can do pro wrestling while doing that in another year or two down the line, then he's already said he wants to fight Brock Lesnar just... Not until he's ready. He's a big guy. What if he gets injured in a match? Right. Conflict of interest. A lot of MMA fans really do not like Brock Lesnar because he came in from WWE and he's beaten their guys. Now, if Lashley comes in here from wrestling and he's still doing wrestling and he's beaten their guys, fans, he's not going to be a fan favorite. I can tell it right now. Cook and Sap came in. One was wearing Ric Flair. The guy had a Rey Mysterio mask on. It's a joke to him. They like to make fun of these guys. And then they get beat for it. <laughs> well... Lashley may not be going to UFC anytime soon, but I went to 101 last night in the Wachovia Center, and it wasn't the greatest undercard ever. There were a lot of long, drawn-out decisions, not a lot of finishes, which was pretty much the complete opposite of 100. There were some okay fights, some bad ones. There was a better fight in the crowd during one match. I wish we saw that. But the two main events pretty much delivered. What do you guys think about Anderson Silva and Forrest Griffin and BJ Penn and Kenny Florian? I loved the outcome of Anderson Silva and Forrest Griffin because Forrest Griffin obviously was bigger, but it's just like technique just beats size. But the thing is, of course, Silva was getting a lot of heel heat because of the last two it fights wasn't, he It's had. not his fault, though. It's his last two opponents that it's their fault. He could have done he, something about it. He didn't exactly try to finish them off, either. He seemed to be like a because cat playing with his Because he's going to be talented later, so just roll on the floor. There's nothing that much he could do about it. But what I really loved was to see Dana White's golden boy, Forrest Griffin, go down. Mm -hmm. And go down with ease from Silva. He was like a video game boss. It was inhuman. He made Forrest Griffin really look like an amateur, like he was <laughs> one ultimate fighter. Silva was very light on his feet, really quick in his hands, the way he was defending those leg kicks, unbelievable. He was like a ballet dancer out there. When he knocks someone out, moving backwards to the point where they dislocate their jaw, unbelievable. This guy really solidified that he is the best pound for pound he fighter. He made it look like Forrest Griffin was throwing punches in slow motion and he was making him miss very easily. He looked like he was just he bored out He dropped his there. hands the last minute. He, he didn't even have his hands up. He wasn't even defending him. Now, of course, I sat there quietly, letting everyone get their hate for Anderson Silva's last two fights out. But like I predicted, the Anderson Silva that we knew and loved was going to come back for this fight. And he delivered. Now, Kenny Florian and BJ Penn seemed as if Ken Flo thought he was GSP trying to take down BJ Penn. You could see the difference between those two fights. GSP took him down at will. Kenny Florian couldn't even get one. And BJ Penn eventually submitted him. BJ Penn is, I believe, going to be coming up to face Diego. Yes! Sanchez. However, much like Brock Lesnar, Anderson Silva goes through his opponent, and immediately everyone's talking about what's next. The difference, though, Anderson Silva goes across weight divisions and sport. Some people are talking about this weight division, that weight division, Dan Henderson, GSP, Machida, but also Roy Jones Jr. is still on the tips of everybody's tongues. What's next for Anderson Silva? 
Is he going to dominate another weight division after he decimated another one? Well, I think he's going to fight out his contract and then move over to boxing. He seems obsessed with fighting Roy Jones. I guess so. Any good fighter that he faces, and all the guys he faces are not bad fighters. They're not. He makes him look bad. He just makes him look bad. He's a world-class fighter, but he really proves that he's a step above the rest. Right now, they're talking Dan Henderson. They're talking him permanently moving to light heavyweight. They still want GSP, but GSP... They were trying to set that up at they, the last show. They, they want that, but GSP, he's really smart fighter. He really wants to be smart about moving up in weight. He wants to move up to about 200, 210, and then cut down from there so he has a size advantage. It's very intriguing with Anderson Silva. It really is who can beat this guy. Mm -hmm. Who can beat this guy? Much like Fedor. And yes. Fedor and Brock is one of those matches where, like Silva and GSP would be, like I'd have to choose between my children. But we're going to move up in weight class because when we come back, we're going to talk about the best and worst big men in pro wrestling. Million dollar man, Chris Harris. So, you don't mess with the That's money. That's true, you know? It's <laughs> <laughs> all about the money, bitches. <laughs> 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 Gangsta Chris Harris. Yeah. Well, Pro Cop come or not this light heavyweight? Can we ever find out? I thought it was light heavyweight, but I guess no, it's light heavyweight. He's fighting. He's fighting Junot Santos at one of three. Okay. I knew he was fighting upcoming. I couldn't remember because I think Junot Santos is gonna win. Because you just said we're gonna talk. Ah, yeah. Pro Cop has been far from impressive. He's nasty. Junot Santos thought that for Doom one round. Yep. Both his fights in UFC has been under like. He's under Team No Garrett. Yeah. He's nasty, man. Kid's only 25. Yeah. We were talking last night, what happened to Gabriel Gonzalez? He got beat uh, by Shane Carl. Oh, yeah, no, he, that was, um, he got knocked out. Uh, that was at the uh, Rampage Jardine. That was 96, right? 97. 97. 